Okay, good morning class. Today I'm going to be lecturing or dictating jury charge. So it's 120 to 150. Let me give you some words that come out on your speed building. You've got terms and conditions is T-E-R-X, terms and conditions. You've got T-E-R-X, sorry. You have um, violation is V long I-L-G-S, violation. And the camera is smaller because I want you all to focus on the notes. I'm having a problem where if I put the camera over to the left side, it's still hovering over the notes. So I'm doing it a little bit different. For the actual test, I will make it a big screen, okay? But for now, I really want you to all to focus on the words. Discharge is DARJ, D-A-R-J, discharge. You've got measure, M-R-B, measure is M-R-B. Good faith is GATE, G long A-T asterisk, GATE, GATE for good faith. Your verdict is Y, R-K-T, Y, final R-K-T. You have grievance. Let's see if we can write that in one stroke. G R long E V N S. And you can one stroke, okay? G R long E V N S. Involved is V O V. Come back D. V O V. Come back D. And so this is going to be one twenty for five minutes, okay? Jerry charge speed building. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, in this case, the plaintiff makes two claims of his first claim is that he was discharged by his employer without just cause in violation of the collective bargaining agreement governing the terms and conditions of plaintiff's employment. His second claim is that the union breached its duty to fairly represent the plaintiff as one of its members in failing to review or even process his grievance against the employer under the grievance rules set forth in the collective bargaining agreement. Now, under the law, an employer may only discharge an employee governed by a bargaining pact, such as the one involved in this case, if just cause exists for his dismissal. The term just cause means a real cause or basis for dismissal as distinguished from an arbitrary whim or caprice. That is some cause or ground that an employer acting in good faith in like events would view as a good and sound basis for ending the work of an employee. On his first claim, therefore, the plaintiff must prove by a preponderance of the evidence first that he was discharged from his employment by his employer and second that such discharge was without just cause. If you find in favor of the plaintiff on his first claim you must then consider his second claim namely that the union breached its duty to fairly represent the plaintiff as one of its members. With regard to that claim, you are charged that a union does have a legal duty to fairly represent the interest of its members in protecting their rights in a collective bargaining pact. However, an individual employee does not have an absolute right to require his union to pursue a grievance against his employer. So long as the union acts in good faith, the law permits a union to exercise its discretion in determining whether a particular employee's grievance should be pursued or processed under the employer under the collective bargaining pact. So even if an employee's grievance has merit, mere neglect, 
or the use of poor judgment on the part of the union does not in and of itself constitute a breach of its duty of fair representation. On the other hand, where a union acts in bad faith or dishonestly and with hostility or discrimination should fail or should refuse to process a deserving grievance, it breaches the duty it has to fairly represent the member of the union who lodged the grievance. If you find for the plaintiff on his claims, you must then consider the issue of damages. The amount of your verdict should be a sum that you find will justly compensate the plaintiff for the damages he has incurred. The measure of damages to which he is entitled, if any, is the amount which he would have earned from his employment with the employer had he not been discharged, reduced by any earnings which the plaintiff had or could have reasonably had from other work. In other words, the plaintiff has the duty to mitigate or reduce his damage and the defendants are not liable for lost earnings to the extent that such loss could have been avoided had the plaintiff used reasonable care in seeking other employment to avoid or minimize the injury. Once you have arrived at a figure for these lost wages or damages, you will then have the task of dividing those damages between the employer and the union. In making the apportionment, you should follow this guide. The employer is liable for lost wages due solely to its breach of, and so remember breach is B-R-A-E-F-P, okay, B-R-A-E-F-P, sorry, that's a breach pregnancy. Breach of contract, B-R-A-E-F-P. Let me give you some little briefs that came out. Reasonable care is R-K. It's R final K, reasonable care. In and of itself is NAFTS, N-A-F-T-S. In and of itself, N-A-F-T-S. On the part is O-E-P-T, on the part. And then you have set forth, I think, a sort. No. Maybe not set forth. It's fourth. No, I thought it was a brief, but maybe it's not. And this is going to be at 130. Let me just set forth. Maybe I'm thinking of so forth. Yeah, so forth is one, but not set forth. Yes, okay, no set forth. This is at 1.30 for five minutes. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, in this case, the plaintiff makes two claims. His first claim is that he was discharged by his employer without just cause in violation of the collective bargaining agreement governing the terms and conditions of plaintiff's employment. His second claim is that the union breached its duty to fairly represent the plaintiff as one of its members in failing to review or even process his grievance against the employer under the grievance rules set forth in the collective bargaining agreement. Now, under the law, an employer may only discharge an employee governed by a bargaining pact, such as the one involved in this case, if just cause exists for his dismissal. The term just cause means a real cause or basis for dismissal as distinguished from an arbitrary whim or caprice. That is some cause or ground that an employer acting in good faith in like events would view as a good and sound basis for ending the work of an employee. On his first claim, therefore, the plaintiff must prove by a preponderance of the evidence first that he was discharged from his employment by his employer, and second, 
that such discharge was without just cause. If you find in favor of the plaintiff on his first claim, you must then consider his second claim, namely that the union breached its duty to fairly represent the plaintiff as one of its members. With regard to that claim, you are charged that a union does have a legal duty to fairly represent the interest of its members in protecting their rights in a collective bargaining pact. However, an individual employee does not have an absolute right to require his union to pursue a grievance against his employer. So long as the union acts in good faith, the law permits a union to exercise its discretion in determining whether a particular employee's grievance should be pursued or processed against the employer under the co collective bargaining pact. So even if an employee's grievance has merit, mere neglect or the use of poor judgment on the part of the union does not in and of itself constitute a breach of its duty of fair representation. On the other hand, where a union acts in bad faith or dishonestly and with hostility or discrimination should fail or should refuse to process a deserving grievance, it breaches the duty it has to fairly represent the member of the union who lodged the grievance. If you find for the plaintiff on his claims, you must then consider the issue of damages. The amount of your verdict should be a sum that you find will justly compensate the plaintiff for the damages he has incurred. The measure of damages to which he is entitled, if any, is the amount which he would have earned from his employment with the employer had he not been discharged, reduced by any earnings which the plaintiff had or could have reasonably had from other work. In other words, the plaintiff has the duty to mitigate or reduce his damage and the defendants are not liable for lost earnings to the extent that such loss could have been avoided had the plaintiff used reasonable care in seeking other employment to avoid or minimize the injury. Once you have arrived at a figure for these lost wages or damages, you will then have the task of dividing those damages between the employer and the union. In making the apportionment, you should follow this guide. The employer is liable for lost wages due solely to its breach of the bargaining pact in discharging the plaintiff except that increases, if any, in lost wages caused by the union's failure or its refusal to process the plaintiff's grievance should be charged to the union and not to the employer. Thus, if you find that the plaintiff would have been reimbursed for his lost wages and or would have been reinstated, and don't forget, and or is one stroke, S-K-P-O-R, and or, one stroke. Employer is plor, P-L-O-I-R, employer. You have, uh, you should is U-R-B-D, U-R-B-D. And then you have injury, J long U-R, J long U-R. Exercise is K-P-E-R-Z, K-P-E-R-Z, exercise. And then dismissal is stroked out. Dismissal, like that. That's one way of writing it. Arbitrary is arbitrary. Don't think of it as ash, think arbitrary. And then you have bargaining is bar in ink. No. Barg ng. Let's do bargain. There it is. Okay, B A R G I N, come back G. 
and this is going to be at 140. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, in this case, the plaintiff makes two claims. His first claim is that he was discharged by his employer without just cause in violation of the collective bargaining agreement governing the terms and conditions of plaintiff's employment. His second claim is that the union breached its duty to fairly represent the plaintiff as one of its members in failing to review or even process his grievance against the employer under the grievance rules set forth in the collective bargaining agreement. Now, under the law, an employer may only discharge an employee governed by a bargaining pact such as the one involved in this case, if just cause exists for his dismissal. The term just cause means a real cause or basis for dismissal as distinguished from an arbitrary whim or caprice, that is some cause or ground that an employer acting in good faith in like events would view as a good and sound basis for ending the work of an employee. On his first claim, therefore, the plaintiff must prove by a preponderance of the evidence first that he was discharged from his employment by his employer and second that such discharge was without just cause. If you find in favor of the plaintiff on his first claim you must then consider his second claim namely that the union breached its duty to fairly represent the plaintiff as one of its members. With regard to that claim you are charged that a union does have a legal duty to fairly represent the interest of its members in protecting their rights in a collective bargaining pact. However, an individual employee does not have an absolute right to require his union to pursue a grievance against his employer. So long as the union acts in good faith, the law permits a union to exercise its discretion in determining whether a particular employee's grievance should be pursued or processed against the employer under the collective bargaining pact. So even if an employee's grievance has merit, mere neglect or the use of poor judgment on the part of the union does not in and of itself constitute a breach of its duty of fair representation. On the other hand, where a union acts in bad faith or dishonesty and with hostility or discrimination should fail or should refuse to process a deserving grievance, it breaches the duty it has to fairly represent the member of the union who lodged the grievance. If you find for the plaintiff on his claims, you must then consider the issue of damages. The amount of your verdict should be a sum that you find will justly compensate the plaintiff for the damages he has incurred. The measure of damages to which he is entitled, if any, is the amount which he would have earned from his employment with the employer had he not been discharged, reduced by any earnings which the plaintiff had or could have reasonably had from other work. In other words, the plaintiff has the duty to mitigate or reduce his damage and the defendants are not liable for lost earnings to the extent that such loss could have been avoided had the plaintiff used reasonable care in seeking other employment to avoid or minimize the injury. Once you have arrived at a figure for these lost wages or damages, you will then have the task of dividing those damages between the employer and the union. In making the apportionment, you should follow this guide. The employer is liable for lost wages due solely to its breach of the bargaining pact in discharging the plaintiff except that increases, if any, in lost wages caused by the union's failure or its refusal to process the plaintiff's grievance should be charged to the union and not to the employer. Thus, if you find that the plaintiff would have been reimbursed for his lost wages and or would have been reinstated to his position with the employer before the breach by the union of its duty to fairly represent the plaintiff, 
then you must apportion those lost wages between the defendants according to the extent to which the union's breach. Okay, and so let me see. Reimburse, they're all the rewords are stroked out. So reimburse, reimburse, come back D. Okay, re I M B U R S, come back D. You've got represent R E P T, represent R E P T. Union is yun yon, two strokes, yun yon. Individual is V I J, individual. You've got there's some hard words here. Let me see. Against, G-E-N-S asterisk, against. Um, agreement. I write it like that. Why can't you write greet? I don't know. Otherwise, it's a agreement, two strokes. Okay. And this is going to be at 150. 150. Don't forget, employment is point, P-L-O-I-M-T. 150 for five minutes, okay? Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, in this case, the plaintiff makes two claims. His first claim is that he was discharged by his employer without just cause in violation of the collective bargaining agreement governing the terms and conditions of plaintiff's employment. His second claim is that the union breached its duty to fairly represent the plaintiff as one of its members in failing to review or even process his grievance against the employer under the grievance rules set forth in the collective bargaining agreement. Now, under the law, an employer may only discharge an employee governed by a bargaining pact, such as the one involved in this case, if just cause exists for his dismissal. The term just cause means a real cause or basis for dismissal as distinguished from an arbitrary whim or caprice, that is, some cause or ground that an employer acting in good faith in like events would view as a good and sound basis for ending the work of an employee. On his first claim, therefore, the plaintiff must prove by a preponderance of the evidence first that he was discharged from his employment by his employer, and second, that such discharge was without just cause. If you find in favor of the plaintiff on his first claim, you must then consider his second claim, namely that the union breached its duty to fairly represent the plaintiff as one of its members. With regard to that claim, you are charged that a union does have a legal duty to fairly represent the interest of its members in protecting their rights in a collective bargaining pact. However, an individual employee does not have an absolute right to require his union to pursue a grievance against his employer. So long as the union acts in good faith, the law permits a union to exercise its discretion in determining whether a particular employee's grievance should be pursued or processed against the employer under the collective bargaining pact. So even if an employee's grievance has merit, Mere neglect or the use of poor judgment on the part of the union does not in and of itself constitute a breach of its duty of fair representation. On the other hand, where a union acts in bad faith or dishonestly and with hostility or discrimination should fail or should refuse to process a deserving grievance, it breaches the duty it has to fairly represent the member of the union who lodged the grievance. If you find for the plaintiff on his claims of it, you must then consider the issue of damages. The amount of your verdict should be a sum that you find will justly compensate the plaintiff for the damages he has incurred. The measure of damages to which he is entitled, if any, is the amount which he would have earned from his employment with the employer had he not been discharged reduced by any earnings which the plaintiff had or could have reasonably had from other work. In other words, the plaintiff has the duty to mitigate or reduce his damage and the defendants are not liable for lost earnings to the extent that such loss could have been avoided had the plaintiff used reasonable care 
in seeking other employment to avoid or minimize the injury. Once you have arrived at a figure for these lost wages or damages, you will then have the task of dividing those damages between the employer and the union. In making the apportionment, you should follow this guide. The employer is liable for lost wages due solely to its breach of the bargaining pact in discharging the plaintiff, except that increases, if any, in lost wages caused by the union's failure or its refusal to process the plaintiff's grievance should be charged to the union and not to the employer. Thus, if you find that the plaintiff would have been reimbursed for his lost wages and or would have been reinstated to his position with the employer but for the breach by the union of its duty to fairly represent the plaintiff, then you must apportion those lost wages between the defendants according to the extent to which the union's breach of duty to fairly represent caused increase to the wages lost by the plaintiff. And so according to is K-A-O-R-G-T, K-A-O-R or K-A, K-O-R-G-T according to, and then I wanted to give you one more, a portion, long A portion, okay? And we'll get ready for your test, you all. Okay, so we have on your 140 jury charge test number one, the people, capitalized people. Let's see if you identify it with an asterisk. I would just put, okay, people is like that. Put the asterisk in and then identify that in your dictionary as capitalized, okay? This is gonna be 140 jury charge test number one for five minutes. Members of the jury, you have heard all the evidence and now it is my duty to instruct you on the law that applies to this case. The law requires that I read the instructions to you in open court. You will have these instructions in written form in the jury room to refer to during your deliberations so there's no need to take notes. You must base your decision on the facts and the law. You have two duties to perform. First, you must determine what facts have been proved from the evidence received in the trial and not from any other source. A fact is something proved by the evidence or by stipulation. A stipulation is an agreement between attorneys regarding the facts. Second, you must apply the law that I state to you to the facts as you determine them and in this way arrive at your verdict and any finding you are instructed to include in your verdict. You must accept and follow the law as I state it to you, regardless of whether you agree with the law. If anything concerning the law said by the attorneys in their arguments or at any other time during the trial conflicts, with my instructions on the law, you must follow my instructions. You must not be influenced by pity for or prejudice against a defendant. You must not be biased against a defendant because he has been arrested for this offense, charged with a crime or brought to trial. None of these circumstances is evidence of guilt and you must not infer or assume from any or all of them that a defendant is more likely to be guilty than not guilty. You must not be influenced by sentiment, by mere sentiment, conjecture, sympathy, passion, prejudice, public opinion, or public feeling. Both the people and the defendant have a right to expect that you will conscientiously consider and weigh the evidence, apply the law, and reach a just verdict regardless of the consequences. Every person who testifies under oath is a witness. You are the sole judges of the believability of a witness and the weight to be given the testimony of each witness. In determining the believability of a witness, you may consider anything that has a tendency to prove or disprove the truthfulness of the testimony of the witness, including but 
not limited to any of the following. The extent of the opportunity or ability of the witness to see or hear or otherwise become aware of any matter about which the witness testifies. The ability of the witness to remember or to communicate any matter about which the witness testified. The character and quality of that testimony. The demeanor and manner of the witness while testifying. The existence or non-existence of a bias, interest, or other motive the existence or non-existence of any fact testified to by the witness, the attitude of the witness toward this action or toward the giving of testimony, a statement previously made by the witness that is consistent or inconsistent with his or her testimony, the character of the witness for honesty or truthfulness or their opposites, an admission by the witness of untruthfulness and the witness's prior conviction of a felony, Discrepancies in a witness's testimony or between a witness's testimony and that of other witnesses, if there were any, do not necessarily mean that any witness should be discredited. Failure of recollection is common. Innocent misrecollection is not uncommon. Two persons witnessing an incident or a transaction often will see or hear it differently. Whether a discrepancy pertains to an important matter or only to something trivial should be considered by you. If any rule, direction, or idea is repeated or stated in different ways in these instructions, no emphasis is intended and you must not draw any inference because of its repetition. Do not single out any particular sentence or any individual point or instruction and ignore the others. Consider the instructions as a whole and each in light of all the others. The order in which the instructions are given has no significance as to their relative importance. Statements made by the attorneys during the and it continues you all. So whatever you heard on the last, you'll hear on the next one. We've got 140 number two and it says no proper names okay starts in the middle this is going to be 140 jury charge number two for five minutes and then the 120s continue so it's all continuous just so you know one forty number two jury charge if the attorneys have stipulated or agreed to a fact, you must regard that fact as proven. If an objection was sustained to a question, do not guess what the answer might have been. Do not speculate as to the reason for the objection. Do not assume to be true any insinuation suggested by a question asked a witness. A question is not evidence and may be considered only as it helps you to understand the answer. Do not consider for any purpose any offer of evidence that was rejected or any evidence that was stricken by the court. Treat it as though you had never heard of it. You have been given notebooks and pencils. Leave them on your seat in the jury room when you leave each day and at each recess. You will be able to take them into the jury room when you deliberate. Notes are only an aid to memory and should not take precedence over recollection. A juror who does not take notes should rely on his or her recollection of the evidence and not be influenced by the fact that other jurors do take notes. Notes are for the note taker's own personal use in refreshing his or her recollection of the evidence. Finally, should any discrepancy exist between a juror's recollection of the evidence and a juror's notes or between one juror's recollection and that of another, you may request that the reporter read back the relevant testimony which must prevail. A witness who is lawfully faults in one material part of his or her testimony is to be distrusted in others. You may reject the whole testimony of a witness who willfully has testified falsely as to a material point, unless from all the evidence you believe the 
probability of truth favors his or her testimony in other particulars. You are not bound to decide an issue of fact in accordance with the testimony of a number of witnesses which does not convince you as against the testimony of a lesser number or other evidence which appeals to your mind with more convincing force. You may not disregard the testimony of the greater number of witnesses merely from caprice, whim, or prejudice, or from a desire to favor one side against the other. You must not decide an issue by the simple process of counting the number of witnesses who have testified on the opposing sides. The final test is not in the relative number of witnesses, but in the convincing force of the evidence. You must decide all questions of fact in this case from the evidence received in this trial and not from any other source. You must not independently investigate the facts or the law or consider or discuss facts as to which there is no evidence. This means, for example, that you must not on your own visit the scene, conduct experiments or consult reference works or persons for additional information. You must not discuss this case with any other person except a fellow juror and then only after the case is submitted to you for your decision and only when all 12 jurors are present in the jury room. Evidence consists of testimony of witnesses, writings, material objects, or anything presented to the senses and offered to prove the existence or non-existence of a fact. Evidence is either direct or circumstantial. Direct evidence is evidence that directly proves a fact. It is evidence which by itself, if found to be true, establishes that fact. Circumstantial evidence is evidence that, if found to be true, proves a fact from which an inference of the existence of another fact may be drawn. An inference is a deduction of fact that may logically and reasonably be drawn from another fact or group of facts established by the evidence. It is not necessary that facts be proved by direct evidence. They may be proved also by circumstantial evidence or by a combination of direct and circumstantial evidence. Both direct and circumstantial evidence are acceptable as a means of proof. Neither is entitled to any greater weight than the other. However, a finding of guilt as to any crime may not And then your 120s continue, okay? Clear your memories. And here we go. This is going to be then 120 number one, proper names. It says none on your 120 jury charge number one, no proper names. And this is 120 jury charge number one, starts from the last one. Further, each fact which is essential to complete a set of circumstances necessary to establish the defendant's guilt must be proved beyond a reasonable doubt. In other words, before an inference essential to establish guilt may be found to have been proved beyond a reasonable doubt, each fact or circumstance on which the inference necessarily rests must be proved beyond a reasonable doubt. Also, if the circumstantial evidence permits two reasonable interpretations, one of which points to the defendant's guilt and the other to his innocence, you must adopt that interpretation which points to the defendant's innocence and reject that interpretation that points to his guilt. If on the other hand, one interpretation of the evidence appears to you to be reasonable and the other interpretation to be unreasonable, you must accept the reasonable interpretation and reject the unreasonable. The specific intent with which an act is done 
may be shown by the circumstances surrounding the commission of the act. However, you may not find the defendant guilty of the crime charged or find the allegation to be true unless the proved circumstances are not only one consistent with the theory that the defendant had the required specific intent, but two, cannot be reconciled with any other rational conclusion. Also, if the evidence as to any specific intent permits two reasonable interpretations, one of which points to the existence of the specific intent and the other to its absence, you must adopt that interpretation which points to its absence. If on the other hand, one interpretation of the evidence as to the specific intent appears to you to be reasonable and the other interpretation to be unreasonable, you must accept the reasonable interpretation and reject the unreasonable. Evidence that at some other time a witness made a statement or statements that is or are inconsistent or consistent with his or her testimony in this trial may be, dis may be considered by you not only for the purpose of testing the credibility of the witness, but also as evidence of the truth of the facts as stated by the witness on that former occasion. If you disbelieve a witness's testimony that he or she no longer remembers a certain event, that testimony is inconsistent with a prior statement or statements by him or her describing that event. The fact that a witness has been convicted of a felony, if this be a fact, may be considered by you not only for the purpose of determining the believability of that witness. The fact of a conviction does not necessarily destroy or impair a witness's believability. It is one of the circumstances that you may take into consideration in weighing the testimony of that witness. A witness who has special knowledge, skill, experience, training, or education in a particular subject has testified to certain opinions. Any such witness is referred to as an expert witness in determining what weight to give any opinion expressed by an expert witness, you should consider the qualifications and believability of the witness, the facts or materials upon which each opinion is based, and the reasons for each opinion. An opinion is only as good as the facts and reasons on which it is based. If you find that any fact has not been proved or has been disproved, you must consider that in determining the value of the opinion. Likewise, you must consider the strengths and weaknesses of the reasons on which it is based. You are not bound by an opinion. Give each opinion the weight you find it deserves. You may disregard any opinion if you find Okay, and then we have 120 number two, the people, capitalized people, section 10851 of the vehicle code. I think vehicle code is vode. Yes, vode for vehicle code. And then you have vehicle code section 10851. Okay, this is gonna be your test number two. Jury charge at 120 for five minutes. In examining an expert witness, counsel may ask a hypothetical question. This is a question in which the witness is asked to assume the truth of a set of facts and to give an opinion based on that assumption. In permitting such a question, the court does not rule and does not necessarily find that 
all the assumed facts have been proved. It only determines that those assumed facts are within the possible range of the evidence. It is for you to decide from all the evidence whether or not the facts assumed in a hypothetical question have been proved. If you should decide that any assumption in a question has not been proved, you are to determine the effect of that failure of proof on the value and weight of the expert opinion based on the assumed facts. A defendant in a criminal trial has a constitutional right not to be compelled to testify. You must not draw any inference from the fact that a defendant does not testify. Further, you must neither discuss this matter nor permit it to enter into your deliberations in any way. In deciding whether or not to testify, the defendant may choose to rely on the state of the evidence and upon the failure, if any, of the people to prove beyond a reasonable doubt every essential element of the charge against him. No lack of testimony on defendant's part will make up for a failure of proof by the people so as to support a finding against him on any such essential element. A defendant in a criminal action is presumed to be innocent until the contrary is proved. And in case of a reasonable doubt whether his guilt is satisfactorily shown, he is entitled to a verdict of not guilty. This presumption places upon the people the burden of proving him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Reasonable doubt is defined as follows. It is not a mere possible doubt because everything relating to human affairs is open to some possible and imaginary doubt. It is that state of the case which after the entire comparison and consideration of all the evidence leaves the minds of the jurors in that condition that they cannot say they feel an abiding conviction of the truth of the charge. In the crimes and delegations charge, there must exist a union or joint operation of act or conduct and a certain specific intent in the mind of the perpetrator. Unless the specific intent exists, the crime or allegation to which it relates is not committed or is not true. The specific intent required is included in the definitions of the crimes and allegations set forth elsewhere in these instructions. Defendant is accused of having violated section 10 851 of the vehicle code a crime. Every person who drives or takes a vehicle not his own, without the consent of the owner, and with the specific intent to deprive the owner, either permanently or temporar temporarily of his title to or possession of the vehicle, is guilty of a violation of Vehicle Code Section 10.851, a crime. In order to prove this crime, each of the following elements must be proved. One, a person took or drove a vehicle belonging to another person. Two, the other person had not consented to the taking or driving of his or her vehicle. And three, when the person took or drove the vehicle, he had the specific intent to deprive the owner either permanently or temporarily of his title to or possession of the vehicle. An okay, and that's it, you all. That concludes your test for today. Um, type them up, see how you're doing. Start off right, and let me know if you have any questions over anything, okay? Have a great day, you all.